All right, well, hello everybody. Welcome to Fabisham Tree Week. This is our penultimate presentation. We've had a very successful week with a great variety of subjects and in, uh, projects going on. And this is a very special one because it's actually Amanda's back by popular demand. She, she was a, a great star last year when we were doing it all at 12 Marketplace in Faversham. And um, I'm really glad she's agreed to come back to do it you know to do it again online um you may know her you may not amanda's a, a, a local artist absolutely wonderful artist but she is also an educator um a real sort of initiator for people to get to know about art and and the environment because she's a passionate and long-standing environmentalist and her work is all about the natural environment and so um i just a little bit of housekeeping say she's very happy to take questions at the end if you'd like to put your questions down into the chat box at the bottom of the screen, that would be great. We'll go through them at the end. Um, and I think that's probably the best way to handle it. So without any more uh, delay, I'm very happy to hand over now to Amanda Sessager. Thank you. Thank you very much, Griselda. Thank you for that lovely introduction. And hello to everyone that's joined in. Thank you so much for um, uh, being part of this and I'd just love to say how brilliant I think this event's been it's great to be a part of it and it's really important to celebrate and recognize trees for all the impact they have on us all the benefits all the wonderful things that we get as individuals and as a species from trees I think this is the sort of visual arts slot so um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, arts, uh, the arts and trees and how artists perhaps work with trees as subject matter and particularly through the lens of my own work. Um, I am going to talk about the processes of, of making three particular inks from very common trees, trees that we'll all find around us. Um, but first, as I say, there's a little bit of context about um, myself as an artist and um, some of the work I've been making over the last few years and why I've come to be in the position of obtaining colour from trees, making colour from trees. Um, it's actually been a, an ongoing um, quest, a sort of uh, piece of research. I think all arts um, really is an ongoing questioning and finding out and testing things. Um, I trained as a painter. I work largely in mixed media um, nowadays, um, but I'm always, almost always referencing the natural world and organic form, natural shapes, landscape, um, skies, weather, natural phenomena. It seeps in, there's some sort of distillation and it seeps into my work and um, pops up in these, uh, in these paintings and drawings. Um, so I looked back at over two years worth of work to see what I might put in as a way of introduction and I was really surprised to see and pleasantly surprised to see how many um, artworks I've made that actually convey a sort of tree figure, a tree form. Um, they kept popping up. Let's have a look at the next one. They're obviously um, mind's eye images. They're um, abstracted, imaginative forms, poetic forms. Um, I think um, it's, a, it's a form I keep on coming back to. Um, and um, trees have uh, an indelible um, effect on us. Uh, many artists obviously have worked and used trees directly, indirectly, reference trees, landscape, nature um, in their work. And I think I'm just one of many artists that's just drawn to this subject matter. Um, and here are a set of three, um, you know, surreal, imagined tree forms um, that have entered my work through a sort of um, organic process, if I can say that. Um, I went Oh, I listened to this Trees in Arts talk um, arranged by the Tree Council at the weekend. Somebody mentioned um, Paul Nash. I've always loved his work and he perceived trees as, as having character, as being, as being real figures, real, um, he imbued them with real um, sensitivity and great emotional depth. Um, and I think for artists and, and, and all artists, 
visual artists, musicians, composers, writers, filmmakers. Um, they say something about us in a landscape, whether that's a landscape of, of an internal um, type or a landscape um, that we are viewing in the real world. Um, we identify with their vertical presence. We, you know, we, 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 we sort of fuse with them um, and they lead the eye. And of course, through, through time, trees and forests have been part of our collective consciousness um, with or without any kind of um, representation. They're there in our, you know, in our folk tales, our stories. Um, they're places where we, we put our fear, perhaps forests are places of safety. We look to them for inspiration, um, for fuel, for shelter. They are deeply in our psyche. Um, so I think it's something that artists really do tap into. Um, on the next slide. But I, I, so I work in one way with more abstracted forms, but I also return a lot to trees as um, great subject matter for drawing and painting. These are mixed media, primarily watercolor, pastel, uh, maybe some ink. So I work with whole tree forms, um, quite uh, um, challenging and um, often want to run away when I look at the trees <laughs> um, that I start to, to think I might draw. Um, but I'll, you know, I, 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 um, I, it's not something I do an awful lot, but um, I, I, I love doing it every now and again. Um, so this is a, a, a local poplar. I've also made a short film of this one just exploring these amazing forms and shapes and through drawing actually we we look properly we think and we understand more um, for me drawing is, is very very important um, uh, this is a, a tree and I can't remember whereabouts in Kent somewhere Maidstone way out in the fields in a very hot summer's day so uh, it's a cherry tree in an orchard um, oak gall and, and, and graphite. And I also draw, I draw not just the trees, but I draw the things that trees produce, the byproducts, the fallen leaves, the sycamore helicopters. I draw birds' nests and birds and the berries. Um, so I'm coming back to trees um, in lots of different ways all the time. And they are for me the the, the, the really the most fascinating subject um, uh, matter. Um, and I'm always uh, telling students, anyone I'm, I'm working with, you know, bring something natural to draw, bring something from the natural world and look, look at it, look properly. So in 19, no, 1917, 2017, <laughs> I was chosen as an artist, of a, a commissioned artist to work with an organization called Back From The Brink. And that's an alliance of about eight conservation bodies, um, like the RSPB, like Plant Life, like Bumblebee Conservation Trust. And they were proposing some community arts projects. And one of which was called Colors in the Margins. And it was about returning field margins to fields where crops were grown because crops now, nowadays mostly push right to the edge. Um, um, they're sown at um, autumn quite often, which is when um, uh, wildflowers, seeds need to uh, take their, their purchase in the ground. Um, there, there's no room for wildflowers. Um, and I was asked to um, think about a project and I designed a walk around this particular farm. And on the walk, there were lots of, it was autumn, September, I think there were lots of blackberries, there were lots of oaks. It's a beautiful bit of countryside above Rochester, that sort of way. Um, and I designed the walk for visitors to come on a day and they would come and see this newly sown field margin. The farmer was very supportive and he was doing his bit. Um, and as they completed the walk, they would come down to the barn and they would use the inks that I'd made and they would make little postcards of the things they'd seen, the plants they'd found. Um, or anything they wanted to, to draw with. They just experimented with those inks. Um, it was lovely working with the project officers for Back From The Brink, very highly trained scientists and ecologists. 
I loved working, I do love working with, um, with ecologists. I think we're all asking, artists and scientists are all asking questions and finding things out. Um, and I also made a series of drawings for, um, for the Back From The Brink uh, project with some of the new inks that I was making. So two species that um, really need um, those wildflower margins, the turtle dove and the shrill card bee. Um, so quite limited the the inks I've used here, but it's I think it's um it's oak gall, chalk and and alder buckthorn. Um, so obviously I couldn't get up close to shrill card bee or a turtle dove to draw them. Um, I did work from photographs, which I have to do sometimes, um, but um, still enjoying the process and um, finding out. I was finding starting to find out about these these inks. Um, and I went a bit, then I went a bit berserk um, after I'd done this um, back from the Brink Commission and I started really researching and looking into the kinds of inks that, um, that I might actually obtain some colour from. Um, and I tried everything. I mean, these are quite staple um, dye, dye, the dye material, which is the black walnut, lends itself to inks really nicely. The Nopagol um, on the right is a, is a well-known, tried and tested um, ink um, uh, source material. But I, I did, as I said, I went a little bit wild. I was trying seaweed and uh, brick dust and um, uh, what else was I trying? I've got a list of things I was working from. Um, lichen, old man's beard, all the flowers I could find around me, um, testing and testing and batching up bottles of, of inks, some of which went straight down the sink and some of which, um, you know, just, um, just worked out. And I found lovely blues and reds and pinks um, and a whole range of greys and blue and, and um, dark browns and blacks uh, in there. So I started to really sort of get acquainted with what I could use. This is um, removing the hulls from um, walnuts. Um, I went to a friend's house and she, because I'd asked her about her black walnut tree and she'd proudly, um, she put aside for me, um, she may be listening, but very thankfully got to her garden she, her son presented me with the walnuts in their kernels. And um, I said, actually, it's not the walnuts I want, it's the hulls. The hulls contain the, the rich dye material. Um, so I went back into the, further into the garden and fiddled, you know, sort of rooted about and we found quite a lot more fresh um, walnuts and I could take those home and then peel them. But you really do need to wear gloves to peel walnuts. Extremely strong dye. Um, so I started to find out what was around me um, and I started foraging. I started to have a mental map in my mind about what was where, what I could use. Um, these are oak apples and it's an, it was, when I found these, it was a new oak gall to me. I'd seen the nopper gall, which we saw a minute ago, the knobbly ones. Oak apples are, um, I think I had a, I've had a conversation with um, a few people about how they remember seeing these in their childhood. They're quite rosy and creamy when they're fresh. In March this year, I went on a, one of our regular dog walks and I found um, this, we, I suddenly realized there's a row of oaks. It's out on near the M2 actually. It's in a field near Osbringe, not far from me. There's a row of oaks there. And I was with my husband and we looked up and there were millions and millions of tiny wasps, tiny flying things. Well, I, I realized that they were, once I've seen the oaks, that they were oak gall wasps and that they were doing their thing to the oak trees, which I'll talk about a bit later, to um, make the oak galls, which house their larvae. So um, I thought, aha, I'm going to keep an eye on this. And so through the year, I was going forwards and, and backwards um, with the dogs up and down that, that field weekly to see and pleased to see the oak apples growing. And then late summer, autumn, they fell and I was on the ground looking for these. They're rather like um, truffles actually. And if you pick one up, that's very moist and they're full of pigment. You can even draw with them. 
they're full of a, a, a naturally occurring compound called tannin, which is where the pigment comes from. So those were oak apples. These are oak marbles, which around me here are harder to find. And a friend of mine put me onto these <clears throat> and I made him a little bottle of the ink. I was so pleased to find them. Um, some of you may recognize these. Um, so these are out towards Gravening. This is the tree where they came from. And I literally the only tree, apart from one or two oak marbles on their own that I've seen, these are the only oak marbles um, that I've, I've found. Um, and I'll show you the next slide. Here is one of the creatures responsible for this enormous amount of uh, weird forms that we see in oak trees. It's, it's Andricus colari, the oak marble ball wasp. So a little bit about how they do what they do. They, um, the, the, the oak tree is the host essentially and the gall wasps, it's thought, I think it's sci a scientific um, theory is that they inject something into the, along with the eggs, they inject something into the oak tree that actually changes the DNA at that point. So they will inject something into the tree at a node where there's going to be an acorn or a leaf growing. And the oak tree then, you know, that it doesn't like that interference. It, it causes the oak tree to sort of bloom and create this growth around the area where the wasp has irritated it. But because the DNA, it looks like the DNA has changed, it makes these very specific shapes. And the eggs of the gall wasp are safely inside. The oak gall enlarges, mm, turns brown. The, the gall wasps mature. The larvae matures right through the summer. And in the autumn, they emerge. Um, and as an ink, I'm just going to go back again. As an ink, oak gall hasn't got any rivals, really. Um, there's many, many recipes, many ways of doing it. You can follow very, very ancient recipes. Um, you can buy the ingredients in packets, but essentially it's been the most um, significant communication tool in um, history for the last thousand years or so. Um, it is, um, it's given rise to long lasting, waterproof, um, very secure documents of all kinds. Um, and it's used with, I think, in all sort of official documents up until the 1940s, things like, you know, a, a re you know registry, registry of, of births, deaths, marriages, that kind of thing, or wedding certificates or your birth certificate. Um, all official documents use oak or ink. Um, so that's going right back to maybe, you know, 9th, 10th century illuminated manuscripts, medieval herbals, um, obviously Shakespeare's work, um, Mozart, um, the early Bibles, Bach, um, the American Declaration of Independence, um, the notes taken during Guy Fawkes' trial, all of these and more were all written in oak gall ink um, because it's, it's, it's indelible, it's waterproof, it doesn't age, it darkens with age, written usually on vellum or parchment. Um, there's a slight acidic content because you're, you're, when you're making it, you're using um, and the acidic nature of the ingredients. So for drawings, um, uh, you need a good, a good paper. Um, but um, yes, it's it's a significant um, and it and it and it you know it, it it could be used if you if you wanted to print with it you could you could work work it with oil you could work it with alcohol there's ways of adding things to inks to change the way the inks behave. So I'll go into the next slide. So I, I, I'm not going to talk about this much, but this these are scarlet oak acorn caps, and scarlet oak is another great find for me. Um, I didn't really know much about pendunculate and sessile and scarlet oak, oaks, you know, many more oaks, I think. Um, these have a certain gall, but I've never found the gall yet. These are the acorn caps and they make a beautiful grey. So that here's it. oak trees giving us two lovely inks at least, or three if you, and more if you count all the galls. 
So I'm gonna be processing some of this uh, acorn capping. Um, that's the next one on my list. Um, so processing natural links. So color really, it's open, it's open to you know research really you just try that, that there's color potential in any part of a plant or tree from the roots in fact from the soil that the tree is in including the minerals and the chalks and so on we have in kent um, would all imbue something you know I, I love that that sense of the the local the fact that i'm going out very locally to find these things but the colors in the inks that i'm making speak of the landscape around me um, and that everything that that tree has taken up, you know, when I've come to it, the, the type of, of water, the weather that it's endured, all these things in a way are, are, are sort of coming through into the ink, you know, that that is all influencing what the tree is producing, how the tree is growing. Um, so everything from the soil, the roots, the barks, seeds, leaves, everything right through to the berries. So there's some elderberries here. And making ink, I've done a lot of research. It shares a lot of folklore and methods with dye making. Um, there's obviously all your research, um, your foraging, you're going out there um, on walks or bike rides, washing, cleaning of things, you're crushing, grinding, pulping, mashing, whatever it is, um, different um, types of material need to be treated in different ways. We'll see a little bit more of that as we go through. Um, steeping, boiling, straining, sieving, filtering, testing, sampling, sterilizing, bottling, binding, preserving. And finally, you might be able to use your ink, um, hopefully you will. But um, yeah, it's very process heavy. So here's some steeping jars making the most of the sun's energy. Hibiscus, elderberry, black walnut and alderbuck thorn. So they would be left for a week or two, maybe more. Um, not in any special water um, and then be strained and sieved and filtered. So oak ball ink. Now my sources locally have been the wreck. So this one on the left is this is how they are when they fall off the tree. First of all, they're quite sticky and green. And maybe as you, if you go down to a, a park or a, a area where you know there are oaks, you'll start to see these now. Next to it, I think, is an older older ball. But they, when they're fresh, they'll be more full of the of the pigment. Um, and they just drop when the when the gall wasp has left through a hole. They just drop from the tree in in their hundreds. And this is a, a lovely big oak, which I'm going to nominate for one of Faversham's favourite trees. Um, if I managed to do it in time. It's a lovely big oak, but because its canopy is so broad, um, not much drops down onto the path underneath. You can see it, but most of it will probably drop in people's gardens. Um, so grinding, my mother-in-law's coffee grinder here, um, which for these... Uh, Nopagals was really hard work and you got about a teaspoon after half an hour so I <laughs> and I was also trying to bash them with my granite mortar and pestle and you see there's you know sort of ground sort of small amount of ground material there so I realized you know take something to crack a nut I've got to use my dad's sledgehammer here's the sledgehammer at before and after breaks them down a bit um, and then those bits go into a little electric grinder, um, which heats up alarmingly. So I have to do it in, I think you're supposed to do it in bursts, something. Um, but um, I then do get that powder. So you get a powdery form of these of these balls. And I would have about 50, 50 grams, maybe 100 grams. They would then be steeped with rainwater. So I would use rainwater. Um, so we don't want anything with any um, additives or chemicals in. Um, and the iron sulfate solution. So this is key to making oak gall ink. You can buy iron sulfate powder, which I've never used. I think it's used in gardening, I think. Um, but I make it in the, in the horrible sort of old world way, which is um, steeping rusty nails, screws, 
bits and bobs um, that are, um, you know, you can fit into a jar and you cover it with vinegar. And that just stays like that. That's my reserve of iron sulfate solution. Um, so, um, as I mentioned before, you've got a pigment rich compound called tannin in your oak gall, which has been crushed and powdered. And you've got um, your iron sulfate solution, um, which is also very active. And there's a reaction that happens when you put iron sulfate. Well, here's a little bit more processing. Sorry, I meant to show you these before. These are when I've um, drained them uh, through the sieve. So I'm collecting the, the liquid again. And you can see the liquid here, further filtering through a coffee filter um, to get out any last sort of little bits. Some people might be happy not to filter through a coffee filter. You'll get a smoother ink. You won't get perhaps some of the, the lovely, um, uh, you get sort of evidence of, of tiny, tiny bits in the solution in your, in your drawn line. Um, and that, that forms a lot of the character of the drawing, but <clears throat> you can also filter again with, with a coffee filter. So anyway, here is the um, powdered um, ground galls, having just poured in about 30 mil of that nasty iron sulfate solution, and it just goes beautiful purpley black. Um, so um, yeah, it's, ma it's really magical watching it happen. You ha it's very quick. Um, and it's kind of al al alchemic, like alchemy, if you can say. Um, so here's a little test, a little test piece here on the right. Elderberry ink, a little bit easier than um, making oat gall ink in some ways. It's soft, you can pulverize it, crush it, you don't need to cook it or boil it, you can work with it fresh, it's very messy. You need to sieve it to get the seeds out. Um, you can work with frozen berries. When you freeze the berries, the cell walls break. So you actually get a lot of the inks and juices coming out that, during that process. That's so quite a, a nice thing to do beforehand. So I've, I've work, worked with sloes and blackberries um, and all sorts of berries. The funny, interesting thing about rowan berries and holly berries, um, berries like that is if you squash them, they're absolutely not the right kind of berries to work with. There's no juice in them. The color is in this skin. Whereas with elderberries, blackberries, um, black currants, there's juice in them. So there's, there's you know, um, that, that you can waste a lot of time trying to make, same for rose hips as well. You can try making ink from rose hips. You do sort of get a color, you will get a color, um, but it won't be as strong um, as the colour you might get from something like blackberry or elderberry. Um, so oxidisation, yeah, um, elderberry, lovely pink colour, lovely pink on the paper. Um, I was also just going to say something about how I really um, also enjoy connecting with these trees and finding out just a, 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 an awful lot more about their life cycles and um, their nature and when things happen and also perhaps myths and folklore about trees. Um, I'm very mindful that elder is a, is a powerful tree um, uh, in, um, in, in certain beliefs and um, uh, ash, oak, they all have, um, they all have great meaning and um, I think that, you know, that there's an element of, sort of respect um, towards these trees, and I'm taking these these byproducts, these um, elements that the trees discard, um, uh, or that I can take without any causing any harm. And um, I'm always thankful to the trees. But getting back to this oxidization that happens, people get they love this pink, but it goes blue. So it meets the air, it goes blue. Um, so there's the same spiral with a bit more ink on it. And um, then there's a, a little note about the randomness of ink making and dyeing, I think. You never really know what results you're going to get. So I have 
a pinky couple of circular forms here, which I think are from dried elderberries, which I then soaked. And then I have the gray blue, which is from the fresh elderberries. Not only that, you get different results on different papers. You get different results, um, the age of the ink you're using, um, the way you prepared it. You get different results on cloth and you need mordants and things to bind the inks to all the dyes to, to the cloth. So that's, so that's another area of working with natural um, natural colors like this but um yeah it's very very random and um i might make one batch of oat gall and the next batch not be quite the same but that's all wonderful i think it's part of the process and part of the joy in finding out what will happen um paper if anyone's wondering about how long lasting ink these inks are on paper you've got various things which i'll talk about in a minute that go into the inks but paper itself has a when it's prepared it has a size in it so it's a kind of chalky material um, that goes into paper pulp so the size on good paper in good paper helps to bind the ink to the paper and helps to um, give it uh, a longer life i i've had lots of works i've made lots of works over the last three years in natural inks and very very few have changed or lost their quiet sort of glow. So alder buckthorn. Now this, this is an interesting plant. It's the last, it's, the, it's the, the hardest plant to find here. I found some in the bling, but only one small standing shrub. It was um, something that grew acre by acre by acre, maybe two, 200, 150 years ago, particularly in places like the gunpowder works because alder buckthorn charcoal was the best charcoal for gunpowder making. So I've actually had to buy in alder buckthorn bark, which gives you a beautiful buttery yellow. And I bought that from a supplier in Poland. Um, and I've looked at other places supplying alder buckthorn bark and it comes from Poland. I think there are large tracts of ancient forests still left in Poland. Um, but going back to that connection with nature again, here's the amazing brimstone butterfly. So the brimstone butterfly loves to feed on alder buckthorn leaves. Um, it gets its name, it's connecting to the gunpowder, brimstone being the old fashioned name for sulfur, which is a component of gunpowder. So I love that that's, I'm connecting through that butterfly species to the gunpowder industry when I'm making my ink. And I've actually ordered some Alder buckthorn to plant in my garden, both as a perhaps part to make an ink maker's garden, but also maybe to give any passing brimstone butterfly some food, um, which would be really nice for them and for me. Um, but alder buckthorn is a great source of three types. Well, um, yes, yeah, certainly three types of ink. The bark, which gives a lovely buttery warm yellow. So here's um during a class I was running before lockdown in March, shaving off the alder buckthorn bark into the bowl and that would then get um, simmered. Uh, it, it gives a strong, strong yellow very quickly. The twigs were cut further and fitted into these little tins. And um, then the tins went into the log burner. I wanted to try making charcoal. So you make charcoal by um, containing your your twigs in an airtight um, container. You're, you're packing them in, you've got a hole for the moisture to be released, but they've got to heat and, and burn without um, oxygen. So when the fire is left, you've got ashes, you've got these tins and you've got this charcoal. So it doesn't make great drawing charcoal, not like vine or willow, but you can grind it and you can then make a lovely ink with alder buckthorn charcoal or any charcoal that you've made or bought. Um, so that's the second ink that you can get from alder buckthorn. The third ink comes from the berries. And as I say, I found it very tricky to, to track it down. So I've only ever handpicked 10 berries and, and brought them home. And they give an amazing purple, which you can see in the bottom of this small image on the right. 
um, and older buckthorn berries were actually used for, uh, uh, met as a main source of green colour for artist paints, artist inks, um, by adding things like caustic soda, so caustic soda or alum acetate, uh, it, it transforms it. It's, it's to do with the alkanin, alkin, alkanizing, no, what's the word? Anyway, alkaninity or acidity. So you're changing the alkaninity. Um, and you make a green when you add it to um, alderbuckthorn berry juice. And then I thought, well, a, a note about green, because green is a, is a hard ink, a hard colour to uh, get from plants. You might get some greens from spinach, um, some greens from, what else, um, grass. But our, the plants that we all see are only green because the chlorophyll in the plants, which is what is there to help it make food, doesn't absorb the green wavelength of white light. It reflects it. It's very good at absorbing reds and other, other um, wavelengths, but the green light is reflected so the plant appears green. It doesn't mean it's packed with green pigment. Um, so it's, it's actually quite a hard colour to, to make, or I found it, and I'm, I'm waiting for my alder buckthorn berries um, perhaps next autumn. Um, from the ones I'm planting in my garden to uh, try this with. So here's some testing. I think this is testing with alder buckthorn charcoal. It's obviously the dark. Um, this might be the uh, acorn cap grey and then a bit of um, an early test of the alder buckthorn bark. And testing, testing is really, really important. Testing all the time stopping your simmering, stopping your steeping, testing with pipettes, with brushes, um, making uh, millions and millions of little strips and little blocks of, of pads of paper to um, find out when the right time is to um, arrest the ink and, and preserve it. Um, and you do that with, with a few different, uh, different things. Um, I've got some more examples here of tests. So this is on the left, this is Alder Buckthorn strips you can see from the left very pale yellow and the longer I've gone on perhaps 20 minutes half an hour the deeper the yellow is um, and then here on the right the blue I think is red cabbage which makes an amazing color um, there's alder buckthorn and there's the red is actually the brick clay dust or the brick clay dust that I ground down um, and made an ink from that. So you, you can make ink from minerals, chalks and, and clays and, and so on as well. Um, so the, I love the, I just think they're such lovely, lovely, rich, but quiet colors. So you need, you need basic equipment really, not, not um, very expensive or hard to come by. Sieves, funnels, um, cloves, um, pipettes, glass stirrers, white vinegar, gum arabic, you can see some of these here. You do need a lot of jars and glass containers and cupboards. That's only one cupboard that I've got filled with bottles actually. Um, when you make inks, you're, you're, you've got three um, elements. You've got your vehicle, your carrier, which in most cases is going to be water. Um, that's the the liquid that the colour is, is carried in. You might want to use uh, an oil or um, an alcohol to, su to suspend your colour in if you were making printing inks or something. Um, you've then got your binder, which in this case is gum arabic. I use gum arabic a lot and that's um, a resin that's ground down and then you would add boil boiled water to it to dissolve it. And it's a catering. Um, uh, um, uh, element, catering um, ingredient, and that links the, the liquid to the colour, that glues the colour element, your pigment, your ink, to the, the, um, the carrier. Um, and then you've got additives like white vinegar, salt, um, you've got uh, essential oils, cloves. The white vinegars and salts, they intensify the colours, they make the colours more permanent, and the cloves and the wintergreen oil um, have antifungal and anti-mold properties. So they'll extend the life of your inks um, and preserve them. 
Um, so finally, that's more or less the end of my talk. Finally, I've got some last images to show you where I've used the inks and different combinations of inks in my work. Um, I do use them in very large canvases and um, in large uh, paintings as well, but these are mainly works made, small drawings and works made um, on paper. So I have um, now started to bottle up three or four at a time when I make a batch and I'm, um, they, are, they are for sale on my website, which is the address at the bottom. And um, then they're, they're, they're also for until Christmas, I think, or just after Christmas, they're also got several bottles at the local nursery, um, uh, Edible Culture, which is uh, in Fabisham. So I think that is the end of my... Oh, yes. Wow. Well, thank you so much, Amanda. I remember it just being riveted by all this, you know, a year ago, but it seems to me you've, you've done such a lot since then. You've actually, you've really gone into much more depth over things. And it, I mean, I can see a great book coming out of this. It's, it's a really amazing. Oh, nice. Yes, thank you. I think I have. I think I've really taken it fully on, on board and it's part of my practice. And it's, as I said at the beginning, it's part of that continuing investigation into what nature gives us and, and these colors that are held in the elements of trees and plants that we can enjoy and make work with. So I've loved, I've loved doing it and getting to know more about it. Well, I bought some of your inks last year and they are beautiful, that subtlety and you know, they, uh, compared to modern synthetic inks, they, they initially look a bit less than, but actually of course they have much more power in them and they're, they're very seductive. Um, so I see that somebody has asked, I don't know the name, it's SHLCHP6 is the name on the screen. How long do you leave the nails in vinegar to make the solution, please? That's the first question. Um, I think at least a week, at least a week until it starts to get cloudy and you might need to just move the jar around a bit. Um, but once they're in, they can stay in there and that's your, that's your reserve of iron sulfate solution but yes it, it will take a the vinegar does its work but i'd give it at least a week right um somebody else claire smith has recommended a great book about forests uh, the shadow of civilization by robert pogue harrison ah great so, i'll look that up fantastic i'd, I'd get that yes that'd be lovely well, that's, i'll that's just good. add in it it's um, a little bit about how sort of forests and trees have influenced you know ideas of civilization and it's really really interesting um there's another one and i, I couldn't find it i got it on i bought that for the kindle and i've got there's another one about forests or tree i think in shakespeare's time and how all the timber was cut down for, for boats but they also have it also has some quite inf interesting information on sort of how sort of the ownership of, of, of kind of forests, you know, and that whole thing about poaching and, and how that still influences. I mean, you've got the Kingswood in Ashford, haven't you? And, and mm, mm, mm. I think that goes back to Shakespeare's time. So you mm. might want, can't remember what it's called, but it's... Um, send me the link, Claire, when you... When I'll you try and find it. I might have it on my, I couldn't find it in my back orders, but I think I've got it on my Kindle as well. So I'll send you the link. That would be great. I mean, it's not just individual trees, but it's related to forests. Yes, yes. Lovely. And I mean, just quickly before I meet myself again, I, I just really love that link to materials. I think especially a lot of people working with paper find, I don't know, there's something about paper itself that's a kind of very tactile. I mean, it, and it's a, in a different tradition from canvas, isn't it? Absolutely, absolutely. And it, yeah, you you really I just the just the surface of paper, just the, surface surface. And the different papers and how they absorb differently. And yes. it's always a mystery to me as to why you should wet paper for printing oil-based inks, but it kind of works. <laughs> 
Um, yes, um, but I, I, I find that connection with, with materials really important. And it's almost like the substrate, you know, the paper that you use and the materials are, I mean, they're just intrinsic to the work. So I use them. Yes, they are. Absolutely. And that, that, that sense of being able to, able to make your own materials too. Right. And, and find it people, and source it and make it. Yeah. It's been, it's been <laughs> too much process for me, but, but, <laughs> I, <laughs> but right. I, do, I do find, and you'll hear on, on Saturday a little bit about how I use, you know, Chinese paper as a substrate. It's kind of rather than sort of cultural subject, but it's, it, it kind of gives me that connection to my own history. Yes. And yeah. I think the way artists use materials is, is I mean, it becomes a deliberate choice, doesn't it? Yes, and, definitely. And, and, definitely. Um, and I think there's, you know, that connection with paper. I love the, I mean, the works become some stuff are lovely as well, but I love, I, I mean, I just adore paper. And every time I try something else, I just think, oh, you know what? <laughs> I'm going to go back to paper. Anyway, yeah, that's, yeah. That's yeah. Really done, really. Um, Katie you know, Munda um, has asked, do you, she remembers using some of your, the ink with you at the gardens, Amanda. Can you remind which we used, please? Who was that? Sorry, I missed the name. Katie Munda. Oh, Katie. Oh, Katie. We, hello, Katie. We probably used um, oak gall ink, I would think, and maybe some berry inks. I was doing a set of, I hope that they were going to go through the seasons. I was doing four... Um, uh, every every um, quarter I was going into the Abbey Physic Gardens and I was drawing with anyone that wanted to come along. We were drawing things from the garden. And the idea was that we might actually make some ink from some of the plants and materials in the garden. It didn't get that far, but um, yes, I expect it would have been oak gall ink, I think, and berry inks at that time. Now, Fern has said, are the inks mixable with each other? So that's an interesting... They are, they are, they are mixable. I've not actually mixed two by putting, say, one and the other in a pot together. What I would suggest doing is layering them. So if you're, if you're applying one to the surface of the paper, then layer over with the, the other one. I would do it like that, too, so you're, provide, you're sort of having a filtered effect. Um, yeah, but they are, they're water-soluble. They would mix, but I, I can't say how they would react to each other. Um, I'd like to know... Um... Whether, whether these inks are actually poisonous or not. I mean, they've come from plant materials and some plants are toxic. So yes. are, they, are they actually, I mean, if you happen to by chance to lick your brush or something, would you, are they in fact dangerous? I wouldn't, well, I probably lick my brush a lot without realizing. Um, I, I would avoid things like ivy and privet. They're, they're um, known to have toxins and I think. Um, and um, what's the other berry? Oh, I can't remember the name of it now. Well, the alder buckthorn bark, just a note, has a purging. Alder buckthorn is taken as a as a, um, a purging treatment. All right, so it'll clean you out <laughs> in that way. Um, so, but I think that's again if you drink masses and masses. These you're talking about tiny amounts, drops, and tiny bottles. So really, I don't think there's anything to be worried of. Um, and I'm not using any known poisonous inks. So. Yes, somebody's saying, uh, Fern is saying elderberry stems are very toxic, apparently. Elderberry stems, yes. So I do get the elderberries off as quickly as possible and, and I might even um, um, freeze them. But yes, you would get the stems away from the, the berries as, as uh, quickly and then just work with the berries. Um, I think that's the end of the actual questions on the chat. Are there any more? Now is your chance to ask a question. Are you planning to do any more classes or workshops? I mean, assuming the lockdown is lifted are you going to do any more kind of live presentations or led courses i did some courses ended in march i'd love to do some more courses it was great fun it, there's a whole um set of things i sort of got people to do and we had a lot of experimenting um so if that's your thing yes i'd love to do some more ink making courses and try some new stuff maybe in the beginning of next year um but i could try doing some online day courses or two hour courses you know a workshop or something like that I would certainly be up for that in the new year. Excellent. Well I think that's probably come to the end and it's um 20 past eight now so we've had uh, you know, 50 minutes of this it's been so interesting. Thank, Thank you. Very much to you Amanda we're so lucky to have you and a very very clear and inspiring talk. Thank you. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for coming along and listening everyone. <laughs> <laughs>
thank you to um, Shirley for having um, set all this up, the technicalities, and thank you to everybody coming for coming along. Really, um, very great support. Thank you. We have one more talk to go. That's tomorrow evening at seven thirty. Dan Khan from the Wood Meadow Trust talking about traditional woodland landscapes. So that's it. Thank you very much indeed, everybody, and good night. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.